Welcome to Nineworks TV. Something very different within Porsche today. We're bringing you an ultimate buying guide to the E1 Cayenne. It's the 955 and the 957. Now the 955 and 957, they're both classified as the E1 Cayenne. The 957 here, which is my own Cayenne as we film, uh, is the facelift. But I thought I'd do a buyer's guide because I've owned this car for just over 18 months now. I've got a lot of love for it and I want to just paint the full picture on what it's like to own one of these, particularly from the perspective of a 911 owner. I absolutely adore Cayennes. It really did play a crucial part, the crucial part, in turning the company's finances around. It really is as clear cut as that. The Cayenne was the third different Porsche vehicle after the 911 and then the Boxster, arriving in 2002 and 21 years later, according to my calculations, there have been as many Cayennes produced, so that's 1.2 million, as there have been 911s made in 60 years of 911 production. There is no getting away from the fact whether you like Cayennes or not, in terms of the spreadsheet, the car has been an unwavering success story for Porsche for, as I say, more than two decades now. You've got the very early cars that came around, that's the 955, and then the facelift model, which is this one, the 957. They're commonly referred to as the E1 or Gen 1 generation Cayennes. And yeah, this 957 is mine. I've owned it for around two years now. It's actually one of the best cars I've ever bought. And the reason is it's a real Swiss army knife. It does everything and it does everything well. It's by no means a concourse example. It's my daily driver. It's extremely well used. It's 123,000 miles on the clock. It does have dings all around it. It used to live in London and you can't have a, especially a car of this footprint in London without picking up the odd ding or two. So yeah, look, it's, as I say, well used and it's still this just indomitable machine. What do I like about the Cayenne? Well, the first thing is the build quality. Coming from 996 ownership, everything about this car is a real level up in terms of haptics and build quality. There is swathes of lovely leather all over the dash. Leather seats, I mean, again, 123,000 on the clock. They're in really good condition. The pano roof, which I'm sure you can see, it's a real selling point of this car in particular and was a popular option on Cayennes, works seamlessly. It's exceptional build quality. And again, what's most impressive is the fact that I mean, a Cayenne is one of the cheapest entry points into Porsche ownership. And as I say, you're, you are, you're getting a hell of a lot of car for your money. The problem is, and we're going to go into this in more detail later on. OK, the car is cheap to buy, but running them is a different story. It's very much Porsche money to run and some. Other things I like about the Cayenne and this sort of stuff is uh, quite often overlooked. There are subtle nods to the 911 of the time. And we always know, particularly now under this proliferation of uh, models in the Porsche lineup, Taycan, Macan, uh, Panamera, and all the rest of it, the 911 has always been central to Porsche's DNA and philosophy. And some of that, particularly from a design point of view, has come into the Cayenne. The most obvious one is the five dials ahead of me. And again, some of these really subtle design touches on the exterior, the 955 came out during the same era of the 996, hence those very 996-esque front headlights. The 957 came around for 2009, so that's very much 997.2 production era of the 911. And again, looking at the back, there's a subtle design reference of the 997. If you look at the rear lights on the 997, on that inner edge, there's a slight uplift on the lights and the way they're sculpted. It's exactly the same on this Cayenne. It is, to be honest with you, unmistakably Porsche. The Cayenne I mentioned is a Swiss army knife and it does absolutely everything and everything very well. And there are extreme scenarios of this versatility that's important to remember when it comes to Porsche's Cayenne. It has genuine all-terrain capability, illustrated wonderfully by the Trans-Siberia Rally. That's a 7,000 kilometer gruelling rally that was held from 2003 to 2008. In 2007, when the 957 first came out, Porsche took places one, two, and three. The following year, 2008, Porsche's Cayenne took the top five places. Meanwhile, the Turbo S was lapping the Nürburgring in under eight minutes. Originally internally coded Project Colorado, the Cayenne was a joint venture by Porsche with Volkswagen to make an all-purpose, all-terrain sports utility vehicle. 
By 2002, Project Colorado was very much a reality with these cars being built, not in Zuffenhausen, where the 911 was made, but in a new production facility of Leipzig. Leipzig, of course, being the same place where the Carrera GT was made. And over the years, we've seen this proliferation of the model lineup. You have the base Cayenne, the Cayenne S, the Turbo, the Turbo S, the E-Hybrid, the Turbo GT, and the GTS. Now for the E1 Cayenne in 955 form, there was a choice of petrol engines, the V6 or the V8, you get a Tiptronic transmission, an automatic transmission, or a six-speed manual. By the turn of the 957 generation, as well as those V6 and V8 petrol engines, Porsche added in the V6 diesel, which again was properly shared with Volkswagen and Audi. That is the engine I've got. I specifically chose the diesel over any of the petrol engines for a variety of reasons. The first one is MPG. Porsche quotes 30 MPG. I don't think that's entirely accurate in my experience. On a good run, you'll get late 20s, but it's still the most frugal engine is this, the diesel. Hundreds of thousands of these engines were made. Considered pretty bulletproof, no real problems. With Porsche V6 and V8 petrol engines, they were known to fail. There were numerous cases of engine failure um, resulting from worn cylinder liners. It's a nice sound to it. Staying with the engines, the diesel, 240 horsepower. Yeah, it's not very Porsche-like, is it, in terms of power, but the petrol engine in the Turbo S puts out 541 horsepower, which is, again, much more Porsche-like. The reality is the 240 horsepower for day-to-day -day driving, I find to be enough, I really do. It's completely all I need, and again, power, quite smooth in the way the power goes down. Also, rather comically, certainly for the diesel, there's a sport button. I've rarely used it. Does it do anything? Well, yes, it does sharpen throttle response ever so slightly. It does change the mapping as well on the gears. It just holds onto gears a little bit more before changing up. That's kind of about it. Again, I would say largely superfluous. Steering, by the way, and again, this is where a Cayenne really shines through as a proper Porsche. The feel through the wheel has got to be leading in its sector. There's no question, the way this car steers and the feel and feedback through the wheel is typical Porsche. There's a lovely weight to the steering wheel as well. And again, it's for an SUV, qualify that, it's pretty sharp at the nose. This does feel like a Porsche to drive. Transmission, as I said, you can get a six-speed manual. I don't think that's the right gearbox for this sort of car. Otherwise, the common option is the six-speed Tiptronic S automatic gearbox, which whether twinned with a petrol or diesel engine is pretty bulletproof. You can knock the uh, shifter left though and then you've got manual override and you can change gear via these rocker switches on the steering wheel column. I wouldn't recommend it. It's pretty slow, it's not amazingly intuitive, particularly by today's modern PDK standards. Chassis wise, it's lovely. It's really nice. This car doesn't come with the optional and popular air suspension. I view it particularly on a car that at this stage is 14 years old, it's just one more thing to go wrong. Is the car found wanting or lacking without it? Absolutely not. I've read some suggestions that the early, so the 955 uh, E1 Cayennes were quite uh, lumpy and bumpy and that it was refined for the 957. I don't have the experience of the 955, but with the 957, it's a really nice, smooth ride. In terms of the layout, so obviously it's a four-wheel drive. It's got PTM, Porsche Traction Management. It is permanently all-wheel drive. The torque split in its most basic setting here tends to be 38% to the front, 62% to the rear. But, crucially, that torque split is 100% variable. The outcome of that is this car always has so much grip. It is unbelievable. Regardless of the conditions, regardless of the terrains, and in my stewardship, this car has been driven in a plethora of different scenarios, terrains, conditions, temperatures, it always has so much grip. I've mentioned PTM, central to that is the card and shaft, it's the prop shaft basically. It does have a reputation, I'm afraid. They do fail, this one did, mine was a few hundred quid. If you're looking to buy one of these and you're taking the car out for a test drive, listen for any knocking coming from the back of the car, particularly when you put your foot down. I mentioned the interior at the start of the video, 
what a wonderful place to be. I have done many miles in this car, daily driving, and it makes daily driving fun. I talked about the build quality, which is exceptional. The panoramic roof, as I say, that was a real draw and an appeal for me. If you're thinking of getting one, trial them out. Some of them do get a bit slow and they're not particularly smooth to use. That's because they haven't been used much over the years. It's important that you keep this roof operational, even in the winter months. Elsewhere, look, compared to a modern Cayenne, which to be fair is like getting into a spaceship, I don't feel like this feels particularly old in here. Again, like it's, it's a lavish, luxurious place to be. All right, the buttons on the wheel, they're large and they kind of look a little bit clumsy by today's standards. So that's the Cayenne. And as you can tell, I'm all for them. I absolutely love them. There is one big drawback to Cayenne ownership, one big drawback, and it comes down to this, your wallet, because it needs to be well stocked. There is no getting away from the fact you'll constantly be filling the thing up with fuel. The good thing is servicing is biannual or every 20,000 miles. But again, in terms of maintenance costs, you are gonna be spending a bit. That's my experience as an owner with these E1 generation Cayennes. Let's stick this car on the ramp at Phil Raby and speak to Ollie, the lead technician there, to dive a little bit deeper into the mechanical side of these Cayennes and identify any gremlins that you need to know about if you're looking to buy one. A lot of them are really good, to be honest. I mean, you don't have a huge amount of problem with any sort of rust. Still quite an expensive premium car. So, you know, a lot of the costs uh, with servicing, maintenance and stuff, they, they do stay relatively high. So, you know, as soon as you start seeing cheap parts being used and, you know, the easiest thing to spot is tyres, it just gives you a really good in indication of whether the car's been looked after. A popular option on these cars at the time was the air suspension. I've heard that they can be quite problematic. The pumps do go on them. Obviously, it, it's a whole nother system that has been put on the car, so it's a whole nother system that could possibly go wrong. You do get leaks in the system. Uh, as I said, the pumps can go. A lot of people get these cars and not, not necessarily adjust the ride height, which sounds really silly, but it ends up sort of seizing the whole system up a little bit. What about card and shaft? The internet trajectory will have you believe that is a problematic part of the car. It can well be the bushes because you're putting so much force through, through this prop shaft. I don't think the bushes actually could sort of withstand the test of time. What about engines? The majority of them came with the petrol. KN's definitely had their fair share of engine issues. Suffer quite a bit with spark plug and ignition coil failures, coolant leakages, especially I know on the earlier KN's, you had um, coolant pipes that sort of run in the sort of the hottest place of the engine. I know quite a lot of them have been replaced for Get, getting rid of the plastic pipes and actually changing them over to aluminium pipes. The water pumps on these, um, I think across all the engines, are actually pretty good, uh, but the gaskets in between, they can be quite prone to leaking. I know thermostats, if you're looking, looking at a higher mileage, actually thermostats could be coming to the end of their life. Electrical gremlins. From your point of view, Ollie, how common is that? If you look at the engines um, in particular, so hot, loads of sensors. When they were coming out, there, there was quite a lot of tech built around these engines and all you need is one sensor to go and you, you'll have an engine management light on. Um, I don't think these are particularly awful. However, they're, they're definitely not brilliant. On the inside of the car, you can end up getting quite a few faults, whether it could be down to heated seats, uh, instrument clusters, they love going wrong. A heater box, a HVAC system. If you've got heat coming out one side, but not the other side, you can uh, be pretty sure it's gonna be one of your little step motors, uh, which are an absolute pain to get to. Um, so it's stuff like that, really, uh, where the technology isn't up to par with some of the cars coming out nowadays, and actually, where it is getting slightly old, slightly more used, you can start to see it go wrong. In regards to the whole electric, something as silly as a, as a blocked uh, sunroof drain can cause a huge amount of problems um, once it starts sort of getting into rear body control modules and stuff. Now I know what you're thinking, it's an all-terrain vehicle, why hasn't he taken it off-road yet? Well the answer is simple, the car is actually sold. After two years of outstanding ownership, uh, I've decided to go in a different direction with the cars I own. So. This Cayenne is actually sold. The new owner is picking it up in a couple of days time. And I don't want to take it off road because I don't want to have to clean it again. 
because this thing is massive. So that's why I'm not taking it off-road. But we have used it before. Again, there's you can play around here with differentials, and we have done in the past. That's your full rundown on the E1 955 and 957 Cayenne. I hope you've enjoyed the video. I hope you've learned a lot from it. Thanks as always for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. It means when I drop a video, you get to see it first. And we'll see you in another video soon.